All right, so now that you kind of understand the fundamental engine that's going on inside the Extreme IO Array, I'm going to dive down into the data services. Our mantra on data services in the Array is inline all the time. Um, and we think this is very important because by doing things in line, like we already showed you how this happens for deduplication, you always know what the, um, you know, per, on a per I.O. basis, what that transaction is going to cost you. You know, what's the latency budget that it's going to take to run you through all these data services. And so it plays into consistent and predictable performance, why our array doesn't waver no matter what you're doing with it. So um, the first thing that we have is thin provisioning. Um, so everybody's familiar with thin provisioning, I think, at this point. Um, every volume on Extreme I.O. is thin provisioned. We do not um, ever thick provision anything. So this is important in the world of Flash because it is a more expensive media. So we want to make sure that we're perfectly allocating the space only to what we need to store. So the net unique data um, that goes into the array, we allocate space for it on demand, and that's all we ever have to do. Um, we already covered what we do for um, inline deduplication, so I will only add a couple more comments on that one since we saw how it works. Um, one is that it's a completely global system, so no matter how big we scale the clusters, um, you always have global inline deduplication. Always operating, doesn't turn off, doesn't throttle back, um, and of course you know the benefits in terms of lowering the effective dollar per gigabyte. You may not believe in them, but uh, that, is, that is the idea. Um, and then also in terms of extending the endurance of the flash since we never commit those duplicates. So the next thing that happens um, in line in the data path after the deduplication is the unique blocks that are left then get compressed. Um, so this is another method of compacting um, the space so that we get a better effective dollar per gigabyte in the array. Um, and it's also, again, completely in line, always on, um, and happening all the time. What we see in terms of uh, compression ratios varies depending on use case, but anywhere from maybe a 30% reduction in space to um, a 60 or 70% reduction in space for kind of a classic database or mix of applications. So it's a, it definitely pays dividends to have this. Um, the next thing that happens after compression is that we run things through our data protection scheme. So this is what protects everything against a SSD failure within a shelf. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a scheme called XDP, um, which was written specifically for Extreme I.O. and is optimized around flash overwrites. And this is really key because we when we get into these situations where the array is being overwritten, this is why we can maintain the performance. It's why we can allow the arrays to run very close to full um, and not have to reserve 20 or 30 percent of the space. And it's also better for performance and endurance because we have to do fewer IOs to do stripe updates than what you see in classic RAID algorithms. So like RAID 6, um, if you need to do a, a stripe update, you're going to do a read of both parities and a read of the data, and then you write all that stuff out again. So you have three IOs on each side. Um, we're comparable in protection to this, but we're doing it with a much lower average write and read overhead. So we get better performance and better endurance out of the flash. It's also a really easy algorithm to live with. So it does distributed rebuilds. It doesn't rebuild a fail drive to some hot spare. We don't have hot spares. Um, the rebuilds are very fast. They're typically under an hour. And as long as you have space in the array, we always guarantee that you'll be able to do one rebuild. Um, but if you have free capacity in the array, you can keep letting failed drives just stay there if your data center is remote. And if another failure did happen, it's perfectly fine. So this is uh, can stuff. You, can you like set that so you want to say, I want to allow for a certain you know, four fail drives and then you can't overhead that space or is that not a configurable option? It's not a configurable option, but you could also manage it from the admin side. Just leave the array somewhat empty and you'll always have the space to do it. We don't guard the space because most people wouldn't do that. I could just I could yeah. just see somebody like, you know, yeah. over provisioning in the array and... That's going to happen. Oh, yeah. Mm. Is there any logical limit or, you know, actual like physical limit on how many failures, so let's say you've got very little data on it, and then they just start dropping off. So today we're supporting six per shelf. Um, I don't think there's a technical reason why we couldn't go higher, but it's, I don't know if there's a practical reason to do it. So as long as they're on the slow rebuild and they're able to get back in, you can right. stand. Yeah, I somebody see, online had said that they can handle up to five, I think, but maybe six is a... Yeah, so you can see here, this is one where we had five per shelf, so 10 out of 50 SSDs were failed, right. and everything's still running fine. Can you handle a controller failure if it's rebuilding? Yeah, of course. Yeah. OK, 
Okay, so the next thing that happens um, is the data that's now um, being protected and committed to disk. Again, 100% in line, um, always on. You can choose to enable encryption on the array or not have it enabled, but once you enable it, it's always happening. Um, and we have no change in the performance profile when encryption is on. So it's the exact same performance specs either way. Someone's asked uh, online if did auto expand get added? Of uh, volume, is that what they mean? That's a great question. Uh, they should write more. Uh, <laughs> if it, Wayne, if you're out there, ask. I need more info. <laughs> the answer is yes. So we, we can expand the volume dynamically. Thank you. How about LUN? LUN and volume test is the same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Is there like a, you know, a, I don't want to, if it's best practice or a limit, I should say, on the size of a single LUN? There's no real, it doesn't matter to us. I so. mean, you know, from a VMware perspective, my, my question is if you're using it for just VMware, do you create one LUN entire capacity? Is there a maximum number of VMs that you'd recommend? You know, how does that work? We, we completely don't care. So the array is going to operate the same way no matter what you do. Um, so we have customers that will run two terabyte LUNs and we have customers that will run 10 terabyte LUNs. It's really like, it's, 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 it's like what you feel like doing. <laughs> um, we've done things where we've tested all the way up to the max that VMware supports and it's, it's fine. Like our max LUN size is petabytes, you know, like you could thin provision it. I don't know, again, why you would, but. Just for fun, just because you right, can. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's the reason. Exactly. All right. So um, the next data service that we have, um, so you know, the data has been deduplicated, compressed, protected, encrypted. It's now on the array. Uh, so the next thing we can do is take snapshots. You guys are all familiar with snapshot technology. This is one of the areas where we were able to do a lot of innovation on Extreme IO in terms of what a snapshot can do for you. So the key thing about our snapshots is that. They're not only space efficient for the user data, that's what you would expect of any modern snapshot implementation, we're completely space efficient for the metadata that describes the volume. So classically, when you would take a snapshot and you wanted to use it as a writable copy for like test dev of a database, you had to clone the whole metadata set for that volume. And as you grow that in the array and do this with lots and lots of volumes and snapshots, you end up bloating your metadata. And the management of the metadata and the space it consumes in the array just brings the array to its knees. We don't have to copy that metadata. We were built around a globally deduplicated engine. We only need to track the unique blocks that are on the array. So even for a writable snapshot, we don't copy the metadata set when you take it. It's using the same metadata uh, for what was already there. And this means that we can get some really nice benefits in our implementation. So you get the same performance profile on snapshots, whether it's bandwidth, IOPS, latency for both reads and writes. You can do crazy things in the snapshot topology. So you can have snapshot trees that go many levels deep and many levels wide, but you get the same performance anywhere inside of those trees. Um, you can delete a parent volume and keep all the snaps. You can delete the snaps and keep things lower in the tree. All this, the things that used to be kind of um, non-performant and inflexible are just gone in this implementation. How much of the, is it application aware at this snapshot level? So at this snapshot level, it's not application aware, but we do do tie-ins. Um, so EMC has products like AppSync that will tie in to the application layer and, and keep consistent snapshots at the application level. Within the array, we support consistency groups that also tie into AppSync. So you can go onto the array and say, I want to take these 10 volumes and snap them at the same point in time together. Is this all going to be used as well for the VIO for replication down the road? So I know you're doing it on the, on the other recover point stuff, but is this something that you plan to do at the array layer? It, it is. So um, we are using the snapshots that we have in Extreme IO in conjunction with RecoverPoint when we implement replication. And so RecoverPoint classically has been based on write splitting. Uh, with Extreme IO, it's based on shipping snapshots. So it gives us an, an efficiency edge there. Do you foresee yourself integrating with uh, third party products like Veeam? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I'd say maybe. Um, there's no reason we couldn't. But inside sources say Veeam working with EMT. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is just a summary. I know we've got about 15 minutes left, so since we talked about it, I'll, I'll skip over it. Um, so just to kind of sum up everything that this means in terms of our system. So you can scale out to six bricks today. Um, we talked about the usable capacity being 90 um, base two terabytes, so tebibytes. Um, with the deduplication and compression techniques, you can average about a six to one. Um, and again, we see this in our phone home data. I think this is a very realistic number. Um, so that gives you about 540 usable terabytes on the array. And then if you leverage our snapshots, and I'll talk about this use case a little bit more, because they're space efficient and they're writable, 
what you can effectively get out of the array is petabytes of space. Um, so things that people used to make brute force copies on that would consume twice the capacity, you can now use snapshots to do it instantaneously and without consuming extra capacity. So uh, these, what we're showing here I'll, I'll get to in a little bit. Um, but it's, it's very interesting what you can do like in a database environment with instead of just having you know a dev copy and a test copy, we can now go in and say, you know what, give a copy to every single developer. Have 30 copies or 40 or 50 um, and have them all be high performance, have them all be writable and you can do the same thing on your analytics environment. Just anybody who wants a reporting copy of a database, just snap it and give it to them. And you save a, a ton of space in terms of how you plan for the array because people would always, you know, they'll come to us and they'll say, hey, we want to quote for 300 terabytes of Extreme I.O. And we go, why do you need 300 terabytes? Well, I've you know, got this application and I go, how many copies of the data set do you have? We have six. Okay, well, so on Extreme I.O. you don't need six copies. You need enough space for one copy um, plus some change sets that might go into that copy. And we can plan for it a completely different way. All right, so um, functional IOPS. When we quote performance numbers on Extreme I.O., um, we put the array into a set of conditions that are very rigorous and that we also think represent long-term steady state production conditions. So we don't want to give out hero numbers to our customers where we're like putting a LUN in the cache and then just getting you know, a crazy number that they're never going to see. So what we do is we fully precondition the array. We write uh, random data across the entire pool of flash capacity. Um, we measure our latency end to end at the host, not just internal to the array. <coughs> Um, we fill the array to 80%, so we're simulating what's going to happen, not just when the array is brand new, but later on in its life when there's lots of stuff on it. And then we use fully random patterns across the entire LBA range of the array. We take out any kind of caching effects um, that you would get, make it really the worst case scenario, and we do it again with um, unique data so that we're forcing um, everything to get committed to the flash. We're not getting the benefit of, the, um, of deduping things in line and having it be a lighter workload on the array. And of course, because the data services are in line and always on, those are being tested as well. Um, and then finally, we soak test it. We don't just run this for a minute and get a number. We let it run for hours and see how the array can stay stable over time. This is important because what we hear from customers is that there's not generally a good understanding of why you need to do testing that's this rigorous. Because they think, hey, if I get my array, I'm never going to run it more than 60% full before I expand it, so I don't need to do all these things you're talking about. Um, but flash doesn't really work that way. Every flash cell will eventually be non-zero, um, even if the array still has a lot of empty space on it. We track this in our phone home data. So these are all different um, Extreme I.O. clusters in the field. And we look how long does it take to overwrite the entire capacity of the array for the first time. And you can see, you know, here's one that took 21 days. Um, here's one that's a little bit longer, took 149 days. But always within the first few months, you've completely overwritten the array, what we would call preconditioning. And this can even be on an array that's empty, so you can look, uh, you know, where's a good one? So here's an array that's only 14% full, but is still overwritten completely within the first 20 days. So it might mean that they only configured a one gigabyte volume and they just kept writing to it over and over again, but eventually, because things are in different flash pages, you've touched every bit of the flash. So this is why we test this way, and we think this is uh, very critical. Now, what do you see um, in terms of you know, actual things in the field? So this is data that we get from customers when we're in POCs. In this case, it was a single um, 10 terabyte XBRIC against a competitor's array that was maxed out. It was the biggest configuration that they offered. And you can see that in terms of IOPS, they were pretty comparable. But you look on the latency profile, and the blue line is extreme I.O., you know, very predictable sub-millisecond. Um, the competitor's array is running you know, anywhere up to about five milliseconds here, kind of bouncing all over the place. You can see the same. Go back one more slide again. I just want to double check on the dedupe numbers that you had on the previous one. Because I was curious to look at some that are in low, high capacity, but low dedupe. And just mm -hmm. to point out, that's why I don't buy six to, well, six to one's not bad, but it's the folks that tell me like 20 to one, I always, it, it never really happens. Yeah. Like one guy is 78%. And yep, and, and remember, this, these were, th ratio. this slide was taken when it was only dedupe that was in the field. We've added compression now. Right. So I'm not tracking compression rates here. So that's, the six to one is combined between both of those. Right. Oh, okay. Yep. Do you plan to build, uh, to build something to, to help customers uh, to see this uh, kind of data? So like an analytic tool? So we do um, predictive tools already so that customers can scan data sets and see what their 
um, dedupe and compression will be like when they get onto the array. Um, this kind of information is all for internal use right now. If it's something that our customers wanted to see, I don't see any reason why we couldn't expose it. Um, I don't know what they would use it for, but it's an interesting idea. So no, far, some of your competitors provide tools to uh, say in the average people use the system this way, so if you continue to use the no. system this way, you will reach the limit uh, of the system. Oh, sure, like predicting you know, when you're going to run out of performance or when you're going to run out of capacity. Yeah, those kinds of things you can see in our GUI, and we're also integrated to things like um, the EMC SRM suite. So customers who are trying to do predictive analytics and monitoring their storage environment, not just for us, but for an entire you know, data center of stuff, they can tie Extreme IO into that and do those exact things right now. If I want to go from half stack, full stack, one full stack to four, is it entirely online? Not today. Um, it will be soon, but as of right now, we sell in fixed sizes that you, you can't expand them online, um, but that online expansion is coming. Um, so this is another example of what happens when you start to run an array um, that's been preconditioned and pre-filled, and now you just soak it for a long time. So again, our performance and latency will stay consistent and predictable. We do see other products that get really kind of crazy. You know, you're looking at 30 to 40 milliseconds of latency and trending in a bad way um, over time in this graph. And that's worse than disk, um, which is really not what people would be investing in Flash for. Uh, this is another way of seeing that, which is looking at a, a latency histogram. So this is how much data has been written to the array. Um, you can see average latency here on, on somebody else's product running at about 10 milliseconds and increasing to 30 or 40 here. It's a logarithmic scale. And all these circles are third standard deviation events on the latency, um, over one second on a lot of these. Really not what you want to see. The exact same test running on Extreme I.O low consistent and predictable average latency, very, very few third standard deviation events. And this is you know, kind of the hallmark of our architecture, low standard deviation on latency all the time. Same kind of thing, different, uh, different POC we were in, different competitor. Um, this was a Oracle workload. And you can see that the competitor's line here in black was actually a little bit higher than a single X brick. But that was at the beginning part of the test. Once you got two hours into the test and it had to start dealing with garbage collection inside the array, this is what happened. Um, the single brick just kept chugging along. And then just for kicks, we tried it with a two brick cluster. And you can see it, it, very different profiles. I hate Oracle as much as the next guy, but I wouldn't call him a slob. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then this is what the latency histogram looks like. So you can see Extreme IO is predominantly sub millisecond, nothing really as large outliers. Um, and then the competitor's array tended to run more like three or four milliseconds. This one actually behaves better than a lot that we see. Um, but even so, you know, three times higher latency and then bigger um, outliers that you were having. All right, so now let's get to some of the cool stuff. So we've covered you know, kind of the foundation, how we disperse data, how we build a cluster, the data services in the array, the consistent and predictable performance. Um, the cool stuff is really how we represent data in the system and what do we do now that we have this kind of metadata-driven design in the system. So the first thing to know about Extreme IO is that all of our metadata, while it's hardened to SSD for protection, in runtime we keep everything we need to know for metadata in memory in the array. And that RDMA connected fabric architecture that we have is very critical to this because it means we can use this global pool of memory to store a lot more metadata than a typical array would. Um, the reason this is important is because if you can't keep all your metadata in memory, then it means that at some point you're going to have a data access, and it'll be quite frequent actually, where you're trying to do an I.O. And you have to, instead of reading the data up here from the controller's memory, the metadata has been destaged to the SSDs. And now you have to do a second I.O. to the SSD in order to make your, your complete transaction happen. So in effect, the more random the workload gets, the less that you can keep the right metadata in the controller, then the harder this stuff becomes. And today's workloads are getting more random. The more you consolidate stuff onto one array, um, the more it gets hard to figure out what stuff's going to be accessed at any time. So. Our system is different. Um, we have a scale-out design. All of this memory is networked to each other. We can keep the entire set of metadata that we need um, in memory at all times in the array. So we don't have to do that second level lookup. Um, the benefits of this are that we have complete independence of workload on our systems. We don't care if it's a random or sequential workload. We don't care if it's got locality of reference or absolutely no locality of reference. You get that same consistent and predictable performance. 
And then you can do some really cool things when you have metadata heavy operations. So we talked about snapshots, which is one example of that. But another great example is what would happen if you're doing things in a virtualized environment um, where you're tied into VAI and doing uh, like a copy of a VM template where it's going to leverage the X copy semantic inside of VAI. So you guys know enough that um, I don't have to go over this, but in the old days before there was VAI, any kind of clone, if this represented your virtual machine, was a brute force operation. It hammered the network, it hammered the host, and you were hammering the storage, and you ended up with twice the capacity being consumed. Um, once VAI came along, this sped things up a lot because you weren't traversing the network and the host, but you're still doing a brute force copy inside the array. The way we represent information in the array is very different. So we have a unique set of blocks on Flash, and we have the fingerprints that tell us how to reconstitute these blocks into that virtual machine stored in memory. So when we get this command to clone the virtual machine, all we're doing is creating new references to the exact same blocks that were already there. So this is an entirely in-memory operation, again, fully distributed across the entire cluster, and it happens very, very fast. And so we can do this at scale that was unprecedented. Um, great example of this that I was alluding to earlier is at VMworld, they have the hands-on labs environment. Did anybody take them this time? Yes, okay. So you know what it's like. You sit down, there's a room with like 500 uh, thin client terminals in there, and you get a catalog of all the courses that they offer, and you pick one, and it dynamically builds a vApp to your workstations delivered over VDI. And what's happening under the covers there is that they're creating uh, usually about six to, six to 10 VMs for each one of those courses. When you pick the course you want, they get cloned. You get your course on your workstation. Um, you generate a bunch of I.O. During, while, the, while you're taking the class. And then when you leave, it's all torn down and thrown away. Um, and this is going on all day long. So Extreme I.O. powers that environment. They're doing this on four X bricks. And over the course of last year's VMworld, I don't know yet what the numbers will be for this year, they created eight, almost 87,000 VMs in four days, just creating, destroying, and hitting them with I.O. all day long. We did that the entire time at sub-millisecond latency. Um, and that's something that you can only do with this kind of architecture. You know, we don't have to brute force all those cloning operations. We can do it in a very elegant fashion with metadata manipulation. And this is why we work really well in these kinds of server VM or VDI environments. Um, I notice we're coming up on the top of the hour, so I could keep going, but I know you guys probably have some questions. I just want to make sure we have at least a few minutes to talk about those. And Where have you found bottlenecks? I mean, obviously, at some point, there's going to be enough that's going to hit it where there's going to be a wait state, whether it's uh, writing the metadata or writing out to the flashes. Where's the bottlenecks that you've actually seen that's perfectly fine to have? Like, there's got to be a workload out there that's done something bad to an extreme I.O. box. Yeah, it's not really that there's like a workload that does something bad, but you can overload any storage system if you throw enough at it. So um, the, the thing you'll see is that up to our rated specs, we'll have very flat latency response. If you go now and push twice the I.O. that we tell you the box can handle, then you'll, the, the effect you'll see is that the latency will start to come up. Um, so that's the classic sign. Now we can track that, you can see it in CPU utilization in the array, but there's nothing that you would do within our boundaries that we set that would cause that to happen. What about replication? I mean, is that something you have today? or? We have replication today. Um, there's a few methods that you can use. So um, recover point for VMs was announced here at VMworld. You can use that with Extreme I.O. You can use VPlex with Extreme I.O. You can use uh, recover point through VPlex with Extreme I.O. We will be adding recover point support shortly, so you'll be able to do it without the VPlex. Active replication. And native is something that we're also working on, but I don't want to say too much about that. But there's there's some things that we're cooking up there. Is that something you will see in, two, in this year? Or? Uh, it's not a 2014 thing. But. What was that you were going to say again? Yeah. <laughs> Inside sources say the. <laughs> <laughs> Do you plan to add uh, VVOL? VVOLs? Yeah, we will definitely be doing VVOLs. Time. All right. Wow, that worked out perfectly to 2 o'clock. <laughs> um, well, nobody's coming in with a cane to pull me off, so if you guys want to keep going, I'm, I'm happy to go until uh, <laughs> Steve looks like he's about to do it. Oh, here we go. All right. <laughs> we have a question on Twitter. What do we do if the RDMA network fails? Ah, so the RDMA network itself is redundant. So 
that's something that's n plus one resilient as well. So you can tolerate any kind of port failure or even if the entire InfiniBand switch, we have a, a whole separate RDMA fabric that would allow it to keep running and at full speed. What happens if the second network fills as well? Then the cluster would have uh, downtime. Network protocols, um, fiber channel over token ring? <laughs> yes, yeah, we're doing FIDI. Um, yeah, we're fiber channel and iSCSI to the host.